so I've got to pull that up so I can read it. Okay, so uh, now that we've discussed what uh, the components of vectors are, and this is the third hour for physics 1A, for what is today's date? The 22nd of February. And now what we want to do is we want to look at some applications. So I think the rest of class will be doing a couple more problems with this, and then we're going to define what a scalar product is, maybe define what a vector product is, and that should be the end of today's class. So here's a simple problem. And you can start working on yourself if you want to, but I'm going to read through it and we'll go through all the parts. First, it says, what are the X and Y components of vector D in this picture here? Uh, the magnitude of vector D is 3 meters and the angle is 45 degrees. Notice something that's going to be consistent. You always need two numbers to define a vector. Okay, There's one number. There's another number. Okay. Part B says, what are the X and Y components of vector E, which is on a different type of axis? Uh, the magnitude of the vector E is 4.5 meters and 37 degrees. Okay. So that's our problem. And we start off and we say that we have a vector D and we know that that vector um, has a length of three meters and it makes an angle, now notice it goes down and to the right and it makes an angle alpha that is uh, 45 degrees. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that the angle that it makes alpha uh, is equal to, I wanna define it relative to the positive x-axis, so I'm going to say that it's negative 45 degrees. Okay, Just a rough sketch of that over here if we want to draw it. We basically have a vector that goes down to the right like this. It has a length that's equal to 3 meters, so we could write that like this. This is 3 meters. And it makes an angle right here that's called alpha. Now, the only thing we have to do with this problem is find the components. So we're looking for the x component and the y component of d, and we can do this relatively quickly. So to find the x component, according to what we said earlier, we can basically break our vector up into a component that goes down this way, that will be what we call d sub y, and a component that goes over this way that we would call d sub x. And if you think about the trigonometry, if the length of the long hypotenuse side is 3 meters, then if we take that 3 meters, which is just what we call D, and we multiply by the cosine of the angle alpha, that should give us what we call D sub x. Because D sub x is adjacent to alpha, you use the cosine. And then for D sub y, you would use D times the sine of alpha. Now again, if you don't immediately see these things, just take the one step that it takes. In my picture here, I could easily say that the cosine of alpha oops, the cosine of alpha cosine is defined as adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's just dx over d. Multiply by the d to the left-hand side and you get that equation, right? Do the same thing for the sine and you get that equation. Okay, plugging the numbers that we have in here, we have 3 meters. We need to multiply by the cosine of negative 45. Okay, and we'll get a number out of this. I want you all to calculate that if you can. 3 cosine negative 45. Make sure your calculator's in degrees. And then for d sub y, we'll write 3 meters and then put in the sine of negative 45. You might be like, oh, what does it matter? Do I need to put the negative sign in there? If you want to get the right positive or negative on the right-hand side over here, yes, you do. Now, I can tell you the cosine of any negative number that's between, like, 90 and negative 90 is going to give you a positive number. So I know that this one's going to be positive. And the sign of anything that's negative, you can actually pull the negative sign out. So I know this one's going to be negative. And if you do it properly on your calculator, you should get that too. So let's do that. So we've got three... If you get an answer, 2.12, thank you. That's the answer. And both are going to be the same, right? The top one is going to be positive 2.12. And of course, it has a unit of meters. And the bottom one is going to be 2.12. Yeah. So those are our components. And that's it. And if you put the negative signs in, you'll get 
positive for this one and negative for this one, which is exactly what we want, right? dy is downwards, that's why it's negative, and dx is to the right, that's why it's positive. Up is positive, down is negative, right is positive, left is negative, right? So there we go. Those are right. What's up? Can, uh, I'm, I got kind of confused on how you got... On how like I got... The, What's up? Uh, like, the, the thing in general, like, the d cosine, like... Can you elaborate it again? d cosine alpha? Yeah. Okay, does this part make sense to you? Which one? The, the one that I just boxed in? Oh, I didn't see you boxed in my bend. It's okay. Does that make sense to you? Uh, I don't see your mouse, your mouse moving. Oh. Yeah, when I use the uh, stencil, it doesn't do it. This part right here. The cosine of an angle is given by taking the adjacent side and then dividing by the hypotenuse, right? Yes. So the adjacent side is dx, yep. and the hypotenuse is d. Yeah. And then you take this d and you multiply the left-hand side, and you get d cosine alpha. And you, and you, and you what again? I'll say that slower. So you, you totally agree with this equation, right? You remember your trig to where this is accurate? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the only step you need to get to this equation... Yeah, the more stuff... To get to this equation is you multiply the big D to the left-hand side, right? And you get that. Oh, okay, no, sorry, I'm reading it wrong. Okay, I just thought it was D, not DX. My bad. That's okay. Yeah, it takes a little time to get used to this. I'm going to use a lot of subscripts in this class. And even though to me this makes a lot of sense, I know that it's not going to be natural to a lot of you, so it's something you'll just have to get. So yeah, big D with a little X like subscript, I can see how that, that you might miss that. Uh, the negative um, sorry, question. Sorry. You, you, you can. I'm just going to say that what Andrew said is correct. It's negative 45 degrees because it's in quadrant four below the x-axis. That's right. So we define angles as positive if they go counterclockwise. So if you go into this this direction, which is clockwise, it's negative. And I think that's consistent with your math classes, right? Now, what was the other question? Go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, how, do we, how do we know what quadrant is in? Because it just oh, says uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's 45 it, degrees. It's the picture. It's just the picture right here. That's the only reason we know. Without the figure, you would not know. That's right. That 45 degrees could be relative to anything. Without the picture, there, there would be no way to know. So, yeah. Good question. Definitely a good question. I appreciate that you're all asking questions. I, I really like that. That's really good. Okay. All right, let's do the second one. If you use 315 degrees, you get the same thing. You can try it. And I can guarantee you that, yes, if you use 315 degrees, you would get the same answer in both of these. Because using 315 degrees, which in case everyone doesn't see it, would be like measuring the angle like this, it's the same angle, right? So you should get the same answer. And that still is measured from the positive x-axis, right? So try it yourself. Put 315 in here, 315 in here. You should get exactly the same two numbers. All right, so uh, vector e. So now for vector e, it uses a living color. So we know vector e is uh, equal to. Now, the vector that they give you, they tell you that beta is equal to 37 degrees right here. So here's this is our vector. It's going down this way. Now our axes are angled like this. Now we don't have to draw them like that. And for this one, what I'll do is I'll actually draw out just a proper, we'll actually use some. So if those are our x, y axes, then our vector e is pointing down like this. So I'll draw it, uh, we'll use this color. Shapes. Put it this way, it's kind of going down like this, right? I guess. So that's the vector that we're calling E. And it tells us that the angle beta is 37 degrees. So basically, uh, can I just draw it in here? This is 37 degrees, right? But that's the x direction, and that's the positive y direction. Oh, sorry. Look at the axes. Yeah, that's not quite right. This is negative y up this way, and this is positive y down here. You're free in, uh, in physics to basically orient your axes however you want, but the way that they've defined these, 
X is to the right and Y is down, okay? All right, so now, uh, if we know that that's 37 degrees, then this one has to be 53 degrees right here, right? All right. Now, this problem is a little bit different. The fact that the positive y-axis is downward may throw things off. So what I'm going to do is we'll show you kind of a different way to, to solve this one. Um, it's basically the same thing. It just involves... Uh, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll say that we break up this vector e into a component that goes that way and then a component that goes down. I'm trying to copy paste, it's just being really slow. Oh, it's painful. The longer, there we go, there we go. Oh no, it didn't actually paste it, did it? Okay, maybe it did. Okay, no, it didn't, it just didn't do it. So that was that one. Draw another one in here. Shapes, down like that. And it might be worthwhile to make this whole thing a little bit bigger. Okay. Now, on our picture, uh, I would say that this vector that's up here, we're going to call E sub X. This vector that's down here, we're going to call E sub Y. I would argue they're both going to be positive because E X is pointing in the positive X direction. E Y is pointing in the positive Y direction. So I'm just going to write it like this. I'm going to say, so let's see, how long was E? E was 4.5 meters, right? Oh, uh, yes, the chat is blocking the graph. So this is a new problem. I will fix that. Thank you for noting that. I need to remember, I need to, the, this kind of area down here to the right is a no draw space. There we go. Okay, we know the vector E is 4.5 meters. Our goal is to figure out what EX and what EY are. So I'm just going to write down that uh, E sub X is going to be equal to the vector E multiplied by something 53. This is going to be either sine or cosine. What should it be for the X one? Should it be sine or cosine of 53 that we want to get EX? It's going to be cosine in this case, right? Or there's another way I could have done it, right? I could also say it's E times something of 37 degrees. What would I put here, sine or cosine? If I wanted to use the 37 degrees, we would use sine. And in case that's not super obvious, let's, um, well, please, let me just click this guy. There we go. Copy, paste. So there's our EX. Oh, this is actually really bad, isn't it? It should be kind of a little bit straighter. Copy, paste. Oh boy. Copy, paste. Oh, okay. If we draw it like that, then make this little rectangle here, then this is EX, and this is EY. We've got a right triangle here, got a right triangle here. So either one of those is going to give us the same answer, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's keep going. So then for E sub Y, we just reverse them, right? If this one was E cosine, then E Y, which is opposite the 53, right? Opposite is sine. Oops. Uh, and then over here, we would have E times uh, the cosine of 37. Because in the other triangle, E Y is adjacent, right? It's over here the 37 degree angle. And if we plug the numbers in, what do we get? Remember that E basically represents 4.5. I'm going to assume that you can do that for yourself there. You're going to get 2.7 and 3.6. Let me see if this makes sense. So this should be cosine 53. So some, some, some numbers that you're going to want to know when you're taking this class that are going to come up pretty frequently here. are that, um, oh, and this is going to be meters, right? Some things you're going to want to know in this class are that if you have a triangle, okay, so I draw a triangle here. It's a right triangle. And if I tell you that this side is 4, and this side is 3, and this side is 5, does anyone know what the angles are? This is 90, obviously, right? You guys remember the 3, 4, 5 triangle, of course? 
Do I know what this angle is? It's about 36.87 degrees, which is approximately 37. And this angle up here is about 53.13 degrees, which is approximately 53 degrees, right? So a three, four, five triangle has angles of 37 degrees, 53 degrees, 90 degrees, okay? To the point that we can say the following, if I have the cosine of 37 degrees, you put this in your calculator, this is approximately equal to, well, it's opposite over adjacent, three over five. And quite commonly, I will just use that as a definition. It's not exactly true, but it's really, really close. You put in cosine 37, it's gonna be extremely close to about 0 0.6. And then for the, for the, for the, yeah, cos 37. And if we do cosine of 53 degrees, did I do this wrong? Yeah, I did, I'm sorry. Oh, chat's blocking things, yeah. yeah. I, it's good, because it was wrong. So it's, it's okay if chat's blocking it, because it was completely wrong. Okay, sorry, let's do it with the sine. Sine's easier for me to see. So sine of 37 degrees, what would that be? Well, that would be three over five. Try it in your calculator. That's approximately 0 0.6. And if I do sine of 53, it should be four over five, which is approximately 0 0.8. Try it in your calculator. See what you get. Let me see. How close is it? If I do oops, cosine of 37, you get 0.798. That's really close. And if you do cosine of 53, you get 0 0.601. So they're really, really close. They're close enough, in fact, that commonly when we're doing these problems, I will just use these as identities. Okay. All right. Any questions? This is technically a three, four, five triangle then, right? Now, instead of having a length of five on one side, it's 4.5, which turns it into a 2.7, 3.6, 4.5 triangle. But if you were to divide those all by a certain number, uh, you would get uh, three, four, five. All righty, let me look through here and see if there were any questions I missed. Anyone have any questions? I think I've answered all of those. All right. Does that apply for a 5, 12, 13? Uh, there is an angle for a 5, 12, 13. So 5, 12, 13 would be, what is it? It's like 5 down here. you got a side of 12 that's a little longer, and you've got a side over here that's 13. Now, I don't know off the top of my head what these angles are here, but we can figure them out in a way that someone had written in chat. If I want to know what theta is, it is going to be the cos inverse of 5 over 13. And then whatever that is, we can subtract 90 and figure out what it is. So what would that be? So the cos inverse of 5 divided by 13. Oops, 13. I can't remember what this one is. Maybe it's like 70-something? 67, maybe? Let's see. Oh, it's 67, yeah. 67.4. And then the other angle would be 90 minus that, right? 22.6. So this angle would be 67.4 and that would be 22. Okay. All right. So um, there's there's some problems that use 5, 12, 13s in this, in this book. There are loads of problems that use 3, 4, 5 triangles. You will see this angle show up over and over and over again in your textbook, on your homework problems, and on the example problems we do. It's because 3, 4, 5 triangles are just really nice, you know? Just like uh, 30, 60, 90 triangles, right? Okay. So we want to keep going. We've got a decent amount of time left, about 25 minutes or so. That should be enough time to do this other problem here, which is a little bit more challenging. Okay. So here's the problem. Something I want you all to know is that uh, there's gonna be quite a bit of time in this class when I allow you to just kind of work on problems yourselves. Um, so we'll start with that right now. Even though we don't really have time for this, I know for a fact that it's extremely important for you as students to be able to try something on your own before you see how it's done. So that's what I want you to do here. I'm going to give you five minutes. It's not enough time to do the problem, but it's five minutes that you can spend sitting, thinking, and reading, okay? So go ahead and take a read of this problem and do your best to get set up on, on solving it. 
ideally what I would like to see you try to do is kind of just draw a picture roughly to scale of what's going on here and then uh, see if you can see if you can solve it at the end of the day um, really what this problem about is about is about adding these three vectors here together. So I want you to try to use components to do that if you can. All right, so we'll take five minutes, try to solve it. So what, what time is it right now? 4.36, okay. So you've got five minutes. Do your best. you one or two more minutes.
Okay, that was about six minutes. You got an answer, that's great. So you can either write your answer out if you want to, or you can kind of see uh, how this all uh, develops, but we'll see. Okay, so I'm going to go through this, uh, hopefully with enough time left over to still do other things. Okay, three reality players on a TV show are brought to the center of a large flat field. Each is given a meter stick, a compass, a calculator, a shovel, and in a different order for each cadence, the following three displacements. The three displacements lead to the point in the field the keys to a new Porsche are buried. Two players start measuring immediately, but the winner first calculates where to go. Okay, so if you can calculate where to go faster, you can skip doing all of these displacements and instead walk directly in the the, the right direction to find the Porsche keys, right? So let's uh, let's draw each of these vectors here. Now, I don't have a ruler. I don't know why I can't use a ruler, but the, the, you need to have the touch version of this to get a ruler for some reason. I don't know what it's all about. I'm going to do my best to draw these to scale. If you're doing this on a piece of paper, you really want to draw these actually to scale. Uh, and the way you would do that is you'd say one meter corresponds to one centimeter or something like that, or maybe one meter corresponds to five centimeters. And then you'd try to draw these out. You'd also need a compass, or not a compass, but a, a protractor as well. I don't have any of those, so I'm just going to do my best to draw these uh, to scale. Okay, so what do we have? Um, we've got a vector that's 72.4 at 32 degrees east of north. So we'll draw that one first. 32 degrees east of north means it's measured from north, and then you go 32 degrees east, maybe something like right about right there. I'm gonna make, this is our longest vector, so I'm going to make it pretty long. Okay, that's the vector that we're calling A. And then 57.3 degrees, 36 degrees south of west. So again, we're going to need to grab one of these guys. And this is 36 degrees south of west. So starting from west, which is here, right? We need to go 36 degrees south of that. South is down, right? So this one needs to have a length of 57.3. So it's about not quite the same length as that one. So maybe something like that. I can't even figure out like pixelation, like how long this is. Oh well, that's okay. So roughly that's our vector B. And then 17.8 degrees due south, that one's easy. That is just basically straight down like this. But it's only 17.8 degrees, we'll make it pretty short. That's vector C. Now we know how to add these vectors together, right? We can graphically add them if we want to. Now this is not gonna be exact, but if I take vector A, And then I take vector B. And I put them tip to tail like this. And then I take vector C. I just want to select this part. Copy, paste. And then we'll move this one. So here we've got A, B, C. And the displacement vector that connects them we go from here to here. Just in terms of language, this vector is often referred to as the resultant vector. It's right up to there. So I'm going to label it with an R. And our goal is to find out the length of R. Now, if you do this with a with a ruler and you do it with a protractor, and you actually make these all to the right scale and then you put them all together like this, you could actually measure the length of R, and then you could measure the angle that it makes, and you can get an answer. But I've just done it as kind of a rough estimation. We think the answer is going to be, starting from the original position down here, you go up and to the left, and that's going to be the location of the keys right here where these two meet. Okay. Now, of course, there's a better way to do this. We can use components. And by using components, we can almost completely ignore the pictures, but not completely. Now, in order to use components, we'll go back to what I said earlier, you always want to define your angles relative to uh, the x-axis, okay? So what I'll do right here is I'm going to make sure that I define this to be my angle for alpha. And what we were given was 32 degrees east of north. So we know that this is 32 degrees, which means this angle down here has to be, what, 58, right? That's the angle we're going to use. I'm going to call it alpha. Now, for b, I have two choices. Now, what we know for B is that it's 57.3 meters long 
and 36 degrees south of west. So we know that this angle right here is 36 degrees. So we have two choices for what angle we want to use. I could do an angle from the positive x-axis coming back this way. It would be 180 minus 36. Or I can do an angle by going all the way from here around to here. And that's the one we'll use, okay? We'll call that angle beta and say that it's equal to 180 plus 36, which would be about 216, I believe. Tell me if that's wrong. And then for vector C, can you tell me in the chat, what angle should I use for vector C? What would be a good angle to use for vector C? You can either go this way, you can go this way. 270, sure, that works fine. So we'll define this angle right here as 270 degrees. And since we did alpha, beta, the next one will be gamma. Okay. Now, if we define these angles like this, what we can do is the following. We can say that the vector a sub x, which would be the x component of a, x component of a, this is gotten by taking the vector a and multiplying by the cosine of alpha. For b sub x, the x component of b, I just take the vector b and I multiply by the cosine of beta. And for vector c, I take vector c and I multiply by the cosine of gamma. And then if I add these all together, it'll give me the x component of my resultant, all right? Leaving a little space, can't leave too much space. Then if I want to find a y, b y, and c y, I'm going to take, yeah, this is fine still. Uh, this is going to be a sine alpha. This is going to be b sine beta. And this is going to be c sine gamma. Now you can see all the numbers right here, I guess to save a little bit of time, I'll just say that's the value of A, that's the value of B, and that's the value of C. And I want you to just kind of plug these in and, and calculate them for yourself. I will I'll go through one by one and calculate these and I'll put the answers down. Just check for yourself that you get the same thing. So 72.4 times cos alpha is 58. Oops. So I get 38.3. All these are in meters. And then we There's no negative angle, right? Huh? What's up? There's no negative angle, right? Because of the, it's not a, We didn't okay. choose to use a negative angle, although we could have. We could okay, have. Because it was an axis, so I was just kind of considering. Yeah, these are all going to be positive numbers, that's right. Okay. Please feel free to check these yourselves and tell me what you get. You should get all the same answers that I get as long as your calculator is in radians. Or in degrees, sorry. Okay, does anyone disagree with these numbers? Okay, if not, we just have to directly sum these to get our answer. So, so I got negative 8.1, and then the other one's gonna be 9.9, .9, I guess, according to what people are saying. Now you may have gotten something slightly different depending on when you rounded. Um, one thing I'm going to say is that in general, when you're doing your homework on mastering physics, uh, you want to make sure that you don't round ever. Don't round at all until the very, 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 very last step. Okay, so negative 8.1, positive 9.9. .9. Does that seem reasonable? 
Now, it's not exactly what we drew over here, but it definitely is to the left, right? This, this says you go to the left 8.1 from our starting point. And then from there you go up 10. So it's actually pretty close. Even though, even though I drew this, like, you know, just kind of almost by freehand trying to guess how long these were, it still gave us a rough estimation of the kind of general direction you need to go, which is that way, right? But of course, another thing we'd like to be able to figure out is what is the length of this and what is the angle made? So I'm gonna call this angle down here theta. And as I said before, this is easy to do because the whole thing about components is they construct right triangles, which means that the, the length of the, the, the R, the resultant, as it's often called, we get by just doing negative um, 8.1 and we square it, which basically gets rid of the negative. And then you add that to 9.9 .9, and you square that too, and you just square root it. That's going to be our resultant. It's going to be something that's a little bit greater than 10. So we'll do 8.1 times 8.1 plus 9.9 .9 times 9.9. .9. Square root that. So you get a vector that has a length of 12.8. And then if I want to find the angle that's right here, to find the angle, theta, we're going to write uh, the arctan. Y square root, uh, this is the Pythagorean theorem that we're doing right here, which basically says that R squared should be equal to R sub X squared plus R sub Y squared, right? That's why the square root. So then to get R, you just square root both sides. Okay. And then if we take the arctan of, let's do 9.9 .9 divided by 8.1. Now I highly recommend when you're doing this part that you don't include the negative signs or anything like that because it's going to throw you off. So for this, we get the arctan of that, which is 9.9 .9 divided by 8.1. And that tells us that, that angle of theta is 50.7, which means that we've got that and we've got that, which means our vector r, not much room over here, is going to be equal to 12.8 meters at an angle of 50.7. Now you can decide how you want to write this, but because it's up and to the left, I'm going to say it's 50.7 degrees. And I'm going to say that that is north of west. That is one version of an answer. You could also have written it as about 40 degrees west of north or what would it be, like 39 degrees west of north? However you want to write it. Okay, uh, any questions? Does that make sense? I guess we have a little bit of time left, um, not much, but it should be enough time to introduce unit vectors. So we'll do that. Let's talk about unit vectors. So unit vectors are defined in the following sense. Um, let's grab this guy. So we've got a coordinate system, right? You've got your normal x, y, z, or z coordinate system. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's suppose that we make this so that we look at, let's say this is unit one, and let's say this is unit two. We'll do the same thing on the y-axis, just mark off a length of one, a length of two, and then we do the same thing on the z-axis. Length of one, and a length of two. Let's so call this one one, call this one two. And then what we'll do is for each of these cardinal directions, x, y, z, we're going to draw a vector. And we'll use the actual vectors so that these things look cleaner. So we'll go, we'll draw a vector that way. And then we'll draw another vector. <laughs> We'll draw another vector, and it's going to go up. We'll make this one blue. And then we'll draw another vector that's going to come out. We'll make it green.
each one of these being exactly a length of one long, right? Like that. That's not quite on the axis, is it? That's a little better. Okay, so each of these being exactly a length one, length one long. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them names. We're going to call the one that points in the x direction i hat. We're going to call the one that points in the z direction j hat. And we'll, put, we'll call the one that points into the z direction, we'll call that k hat, like that. Okay? Each of these is what we call a unit vector, i, j, and k. Unit vectors have the property that they are length one. And they point along the x, y, or z direction. They point along one of your axes. Now, in the case of x, y, z, that's going to be i, j, k. But I'm sure in your mathematics classes, you've all learned about polar coordinates, and you've learned about spherical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates. You can have unit vectors for that stuff, too. But that's for later. We're just starting with the simplest possible thing, which is Cartesian coordinates, i, j, k, like this. So they have length 1, which means you can write certain things down about them, such as if I take the magnitude of a vector of the i hat vector, it's equal to 1. If I take the magnitude of the j hat vector like this, it's equal to 1. OK? And we can use this to construct vectors now. So let's say that I wanted to write a vector, and I'm going to label my vector a. And I'm going to say that it happens to be equal to uh, 2 i hat okay, plus 1 j hat. This vector says go 2 to the right and 1 up, right? And we can easily draw it on our picture right here. You just need 2 i's. You can see that my 2 wasn't exactly the second, actually. You need to go out 2, so 2 i's, right? And then you just need to go up 1. So let's draw another vector in here. I'll make it black. And it'll go from the origin out to that point right there, roughly. To make sure that it's actually going the right way, I just want to collect this dude and move him right there. And then what we can do is we can actually make it so that this vector goes all the way up to it. Okay. So there's my vector A, and I guess for clarity, I maybe could have made this a different color, like this color, and then clarify by doing this. Let me select, please. There it goes. Oh boy, as we get more and more things on the, uh, okay, there's my vector A, and it's basically two I hat plus one J hat. You can see it's two to the right. And this is a great way to write a vector. It's a great way to write a vector. There's another way that it's also written that you'll see in your math classes. I noticed people were already doing that in the chat. You can also write this as 2 comma 1 if you prefer. Okay, But your textbook is going to use the IJK notation. They mean the exact same thing. These mean exactly the same thing. Okay, But uh, yeah, 2 i hat plus 1 j hat is that vector right here. Now the nice thing about this is we can introduce a third dimension in a very, very simple way. right? Like I can give you a vector. I can call a vector b, and I can just say, let's say this vector is like negative 2 i hat plus 3 j hat, and then plus 2 k hat or something like that, right? And while I can't really draw that, you're right. Mastering physics will not accept this. That's correct. They will accept this, though. They will accept the, the i j notation, right? But I, I can write a vector like that, and, and you, you'll know what it means. It's you go down two, you go, oh, no, sorry, you go left two, that's negative two j, right? And then you go up three, so somewhere up here, but then you've got to go out along the z-axis this direction. So it's three-dimensional, it's kind of hard to draw it, but it's very easy to write it, right? So, yeah. What is this doing? I'm wondering if I turn this off, if, I don't know. I don't want to play with these things. OK, regardless, um, we're running out of time, so I need to keep going. So that's a way to write uh, a vector like this. And it's really easy to add these vectors together, actually, right? Because now if I want to add a plus b, it's basically already written in a component form. And so all I have to do is to do collect the i's, right? So I've got 2 minus 2 times i hat. I've got 
1 plus 3 times j hat, and I've got, this one doesn't have any k's, right? So just 2k hat. That's what the sum of those two vectors are. And it turns out that it's equal to 4j hat plus 2k hat. And that's what a unit vector is. It's really, really powerful. Really powerful. Can I introduce vector multiplication and just say we'll talk more about it next time? I think I can. Three minutes. So let's talk about how you multiply vectors. And the first thing we'll talk about is the scalar product. Okay, the scalar product does the following. Suppose I have a vector that points this way and I call it A. And I have another vector that points this way and I call it B. And let's say that I also know the angle between the two of them and it's called theta. We can define a product of vectors by doing the following. The vector A dot products, it's a dot, not a, not a times, not an asterisk, it's a dot, a big fat dot. So vector A dot B, this is also known as the dot product. Okay, the dot product. Vector A dot product with vector B is given by this expression. You take the magnitude of vector A, you multiply by the magnitude of vector B, and you multiply by the cosine of the angle between the two of them, theta. So for example, if I gave you some values, this is really easy to calculate. Suppose that I tell you that the magnitude of vector A is equal to um, 20 meters. The magnitude of vector B, let's say, is looks a little bit longer, right? So let's call it uh, 25 meters. And then if I say that the included angle between the two of them, and now there's two possible angles, right? So we always mean the smallest possible angle between the two of them in this case. If the included angle theta uh, is equal to, um, let's give a pretty simple number here, like, because it doesn't look like it. We're just gonna pick 60 degrees because it's simple. Then what we would get is a dot b would be just 20 times 40, uh, 25, whoops. Undo, undo. Times 25 and then times cos 60, which I chose because cosine 60 is a half. So this is basically going to be 250. And the units matter, okay? Meters times meters, it's not just meters, it's meters squared. So this would have units of area, as it turns out. Wouldn't have to, but. Now, if you think about what you're doing here, there's just kind of a couple different ways to think about it, but. One of the ways you can think about it is like this. If I make a if I make a right triangle here, then this little side of my triangle, which is basically a projection of vector A onto projector onto vector B, is A cosine theta. I don't know if that helps you see why we use the cosine. But yeah. B times A cos theta is what we get out of this. Um yeah. That's the, that's the scalar product. That's one way to do it. I think we have till 510, so I'm going to keep going because I want to at least present this stuff to you so you can see it. Sure, Murdo? Yeah. What's up? Is it uh, 20 times 25 times cosine of 60? That's not 250. <laughs> okay. Sorry. What's it equal to? Wait, like, because uh, I did it. Uh, then it's, it's 0 0.5 is cosine of 60, then times 20. 25 is 12.5, then... Oh, damn. Sorry, I, I put minus. That's okay. Don't worry about it. That's good. I I make tons of mistakes, so I highly highly encourage you to doubt everything that I put up here. Please please do. I make lots of mistakes. Okay, so that's one way to do it, all right? But there's an even, even easier way to do it, actually, if you use unit vectors. So let's think about the following scenarios. What would, what would i.j be equal to? So i hat dot j hat, what's that equal to? We follow our definition right here. And I'm going to draw a little picture here. j hat points this way, right? i hat points this way. What would the angle between the two of them be? Remember that i is parallel to x and j is parallel to y. What's the angle here have to be? It's a 90 degree angle, right? OK, so Let's follow our definition for the scalar product. It says, I take the magnitude of the first vector, so I'm going to take the magnitude of vector i hat. I multiply by the magnitude of the second vector, which is the magnitude of vector j hat, right? And then I multiply by the cosine of the included angle between the two of them, 
Uh, I could choose 270, that would be wrong, or I could choose 90, the smaller angle between the two of them here, right? So that's 90 degrees. And then what's all of this equal to? Well, the length of vector i is 1, the length of vector j is 1, they're unit vectors, they always have length 1, and the cosine of 90, well, that's 0. So this is equal to 0. Does anyone want to guess what uh, i hat dot k hat would be? What would that be? So we do 1 times 1 times cosine 90 again, right? Because the angle between the x-axis and the z-axis is also... So it turns out that as long as you use things that are different from each other, you always get 0. Okay. So that's powerful. There's another thing we can say about this dot product, which is that it's um, commutative, which is to say that if I put a dot b, it's the same thing as b dot a. Doesn't change anything, right? Um, so let's try something else then. What about i hat dot i hat? What is that going to be equal to? That's going to be equal to 1, because this is going to be 1 times 1 times the cosine of the angle between a vector and itself. Well, the angle between a vector and itself is just 0, and a cosine 0 is 1. So this is all just 1. And you could say the same thing for j dot j and k dot k. They're all equal to 1. So now, let's say that we have some more complicated vectors. So let's say that I give you a vector like a and I tell you it's equal to, let's just, I guess we, no, we do three dimensions. We'll do three dimensions. So I say vector A is equal to 3i hat plus uh, 7j hat and then minus k hat. And I give you vector B and I say that that's equal to, oh, let's just do 2i hat plus negative 1j hat and then... 5k hat or something like that. Those are fine, right? And now I say, what's the dot product of those two? Well, I'd have to write it out like this. We would say a dot b and then we put our dot products in here, right? We dot products with the second one. You don't necessarily have to write these ones here. So I'm kind of intentionally writing it different ways. Like negative k hat is the same as negative 1. You put a 1 there if you want to. Now, how am I going to do this? Well, really what we need to do is there would be nine terms here, right? You would have this one times this one, dot product. That would be 3 times 2. And then i times i dot i. Remember, i dot i is 1, right? So you get 6. And now let's just go and do the other ones that we know that are easy. If I do 7j dot product with negative j hat, I'm going to get 7 times negative 1, which is negative 7, and then j hat dot j hat, which is 1. Finally, if I do this one here, the last two, negative 1 times 5 is negative 5, and then k hat dot k hat is 1, right? Everyone following what we've done so far? Now there are a total of how many other terms that I haven't included? How many other possibilities are there if I'm doing a set of three times a set of three? There'd be nine total possibilities, right? Of how we can combine those. And if this was your algebra class, and you're back in ninth grade or whatever, tenth grade, and you're taking algebra, then you'd have to multiply them all out, right? If this was 3x plus 7y plus minus z, You'd have to multiply out every single term, and you get nine terms. It'd take a long time, right? Trinomial times a trinomial. But we just said that any combination where you have like an i dot k, like this one and this one, or an i dot j, like this one and this one, you get zero. So lo and behold, this is the answer. All other possibilities are zero, so we get negative 12 plus 6, which is negative 6, is equal to a dot b. You get one number get one number. It's called a scalar product because you start off with two vectors and you end up with a scalar.
You just get a number. Just a number. And if these things had units, like if these were all in meters, for example, our answer would be in meters squared. But uh, it's a scalar, nonetheless, right? Okay, I have I've gone at least two minutes over time. I'm sure you all have other things you need to be doing, but this is as good a place to stop, I believe, as any. Uh, what we'll start with next time is, and you can try to do this if you want to, there's a problem in the book. We're going to try to find the angle between these two vectors. Now that we know how to do the dot products, we're going to use the dot product to find the included angle between two three-dimensional vectors, which is a really powerful thing to do because it's hard to imagine things in three dimensions, but there are mathematical operations that we can do to like find angles between vectors, even if they are in three dimensions. So that's pretty powerful. Anyway, we'll leave that for next time. Uh, sorry to go on a little long, but We'll pick up next time on Wednesday. And like I said last week, this week, our Wednesday lecture will probably be a little longer just to make sure we're going at a fast enough pace to keep you uh, up with your, your homework and stuff like that. I will stick around and answer any questions that anyone has. Uh, I have my next office hours are on Wednesday at noon. So stop by if you have questions there. And yeah, thanks everyone. I hope you all have a nice night and uh, I'll see you on Wednesday.